the question that I have has to do with India Inc. and the youth specifically. At the age of 19, you wrote an article with the backdrop of emergency and uh, you spoke about independence and you spoke about the sense of identity and patriotism. Today, you speak about the thrust of Indian economy and, in, and industry. You talk about Tata, you talk about GVK, and you talk about all these other companies going abroad and sort of promoting India and business in India as a very positive step, but also taking business to these countries. Um, what role do you envision the youth and opportunities for the youth have in this national identity and, and future of our country in this area? Well, there's a lot that youth can do, but actually, since Sanjay is sitting here, I can point to a titan of industry and ask the question also, which is, what can industry and the private sector and our big companies do to engage young people in their international ventures? You know, the French, and I've written about this in one of my essays in this book, the French have a scheme under which the government provides incentives and even some subventions to their companies to take young French students, usually just out of high school or just out of university, in sort of internship type positions in French companies' overseas operations. And part of the idea is for, the, for a, a generation of young French people to get an idea of the rest of the world, to break free of their insularity, to see what's going on. But it also helps expand the horizons of these young people to, um, to uh, uh, have that kind of internationalist mindset. And I would argue that uh, it's, it's not a difficult thing for the government of India, I have argued, uh, to think about doing this. Some tax incentives, maybe some, some breaks, um, maybe even some subsidies so a company will find it worthwhile. I'm sure that uh, if I catch Sanjay in a quiet corner, he'll say, why is it worth it, worth it for my company to spend money on a young chap who doesn't know anything and can't contribute effectively? I'm basically doing some free training for what? But the answer is partly it's national, it's a contribution to the nation and to the young person himself who might one day, if he or she shows a talent and aptitude, might be a well, well, well be a future recruit for you with that experience. But equally, it contributes to the widening and broadening of India's horizons as these young people grow older. And I just think that we need now to very consciously be waking up to our international responsibilities. We are, you know, we cannot afford to, in this globalized world we simply cannot be indifferent to our international footprint. And if a company like yours, Sanjay, can go out and establish companies outside, uh, you ought to be able to, giving, to, to give opportunities to young Indians uh, to, to, to partake of what you're up to and, and to learn from it, and perhaps one day to contribute even more to you and one day to your rivals, who knows, but at least to the future of India in this way. That, that's, the, that's the idea that I was trying to propagate. Uh, it was another interesting aspect about you is you talk about Mahabharata so very much. In fact, when somebody referred to England as Shakespeare and a church and a Walmart or something like that, so you said Mahabharata is what it is for India. And you also wrote a, no a novel about it. So on a lighter note, I would just like to know if you had to equate uh, our Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, to some character in Mahabharata, <laughs> who would it be? You have to answer that now. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I'm not sure I should be going there at all, but I suppose this is, this is Ekalavya who didn't cut, up, cut off his thumb because he actually has learned a lot of lessons from watching uh, the, if you like, those with a greater sense of entitlement uh, to wielding the instruments of power. And he has now supplanted them, but he didn't cut off his thumb when he was asked to, if you like. He decided to continue uh, his archery and his, his swordsmanship, and he managed to conquer the place. A very diplomatic indeed. Thank you. Um, round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. The last question I have uh, is of great personal importance, and I think specifically towards Hyderabad as well. Uh, Prime Minister Nehru famously said, India does not need an army, and we have a very large paramilitary security police presence in this country who, ha who serve a multitude of purposes, civil, social. But you talk about a community element to that purpose. Um, my question is, minority and policing, what are the merits of increased outreach and recruitment of officers for minorities? You know, it's indispensable. You know, one of the things that uh, I started writing uh, some years ago when I had a column in the Times of India and so on, Lin and in the Hindu, and which I specifically started emphasizing after 2611, was that if our response to terror becomes counterproductive. If we in any way alienate a section of our own society through the way in which we are dealing with terror, uh, we will actually be facilitating the terrorist victory. Because 
I'm sorry to say this, it may be an example that cuts close to home, but in Hyderabad there was a bomb and promptly the cops rounded up every sort of Muslim auto rickshaw driver from the old town. Uh, uh, this was, I think, a huge mistake because uh, these young people who are getting arrested are being arrested essentially only on the basis of their profession and their socioeconomic level. I beg your pardon, their religion and their socioeconomic level. And if you do that, you are basically f making an entire religious community feel stereotyped, thereby vulnerable, therefore alienated. You're also depriving these poor people of their livelihood for the time that they're detained. Inevitably, 99% of them will be found to be innocent, if not all of them. They'll be released, but meanwhile, their lives will have been wrecked. Their own families will have suffered social ostracism and other problems because their sons have been arrested. Uh, it seems to me deeply, dangerously counterproductive. And I think one of the answers to how to deal with, I mean, let's face it, there is a problem of terrorism infused with a certain extremist Islamist agenda. We can't deny that. It's there, it's part of the, the rhetoric of some of these groups and so on. So we have to deal with it. We can't deal with it by making every Indian Muslim, there are 160 million of them, a potential terrorist. Uh, so my answer partly, and it's only partly, is that we need to go out of our way to strengthen the involvement of minority elements in the law enforcement process, in police, in intelligence, in, in the armed forces, in the paramilitary forces. And we don't at the moment have a mechanism, which is why I suggest one. Let me say in parentheses that I thought one of the great strengths of our victory over Sikh terrorism in Punjab was that the majority of the police force were Sikhs themselves. So that it never became an issue of non-Sikhs versus Sikhs or Hindus versus Sikhs or whatever else. It was the Indian state and the Indian police services and the Indian armed forces, all of which are full of, 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 of Sikhs, putting down a bunch of misguided extremists who happen to be Sikh. Now, we should be able to say that about the rest of our law and order apparatus, that it's the law and order of India, of the Indian state and Indian society, which happens to have all communities represented in it, happening, I mean, putting down uh, a bunch of extremists, terrorists, or violent people, some of whom, or many of whom, may happen to be from a particular community. Now, the only way this syllogism works is if there are more Muslims in these forces than there are today. Because of a historical accident, the tragedy of partition, where so many of the educated Muslim middle class uh, migrated to Pakistan, the Muslim community has had disproportionate sociological sort of uh, uh, divisions. That is, there are more poor Muslims than there are of other societies, uh, uh, fewer educated Muslims, and so on and so forth. So it's the one thing that you see is that in proportion to the population of Muslims in India, we do not have a comparable percentage in the uh, armed services, whether it's the paramilitary, the army, the um, police, uh, or the intelligence. And it seems to me that the government needs to rectify this. So the government claims to have its hands tied because, of course, there are no quotas possible on, the, on a religious basis. Uh, there are no uh, kind of positive discrimination. Now, I looked around the rest of the world to see what other countries are doing about this. And one example I found that interested me was what the British have been doing with their police forces when they had the same realization that they were tending to stereotype the minorities, the Asians, so-called, uh, in, in England, um, while at the same time uh, not having enough Asians in the police forces. Now, they too have no quotas, so they can't hire more Asians or whatever. But what they did was they started sending police officers to Asian communities, and particularly poorer, lower class communities, uh, living with them and so on, and helping them develop an interest in the police services in order to apply. Now, in India, most of these services require competitive examinations. And it's often said that the Muslim community has a lot of people who are not equipped to take the examinations. So one of the suggestions I've made in my book is, why not get um, from the government at no cost to the community, special remedial coaching classes. So you're not giving a quota, you're not giving them X percentage of marks. They have to pass the exams. But you give them coaching classes to enable them to pass the exams so that they have that leg up that the community needs. It seems to me, it's, this is just one suggestion, many people may have other ideas, but it's a way of trying to get around this problem that we are so unrepresentative you know, it's very important that our 
our uh, law and order forces, it seems to me, Kavita, I'd love your thoughts on this, that our law and order forces should represent the entire diversity of our society and all its communities. And one way we can do that is by seeing which communities are grossly underrepresented uh, and helping them to be involved. And, and the Muslim community is particularly important because they become a target of law, law enforcement uh, in this way. And that's, that's one of the essays in this book. I really liked your suggestion and as an extension to what you've said till now, the officers currently in force who are serving, they should actually go live with the, in the Muslim mohallas to more, you know, understand their psyche or understand their poverty or the situations which drive them to, you know, do this or probably shelter the uh, antisocial elements or whatever. That was really an interesting one. Uh, probably we should push for something like that is what I thought. But I Yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly what I've suggested as well, that we have our officers going out doing sort of, you know, outreach work in the communities, in the Muslim mohallas, in the Basis, and at the same time offering these ex remedial classes and so on. Um, I'm very happy to try and raise it in Parliament, and I'm counting on your support. <laughs> Great. There you go. We are making the nation one step at a time, as you can see. Um, sorry, there is one last question, which I wanted to ask the two of you as parliamentarians and leaders, and to all those in the audience who represent yes, our country. Yes, Kalikesh is a member of Parliament. Parliament has been twice, three times member of Parliament. Shahid has been a member of Parliament. Mahat Mr. Singh, is, Singh Deo is, is a member of Parliament. So we have a good, good turnout of political leaders here. Um, the European Union is very well known for their policy uploading and downloading mechanism. Especially after Maastricht, they institutionalized a mechanism by which countries who have successfully implemented certain policies in a broad uh, diversity of areas have a way in which they can download and understand this policy and try and implement it towards a specific end within their country or their, spe their specific region. Overcoming national divides, overcoming regional divides, state divides, cultural, religious, and all the other divides which make us unique as a country, would you be in favor of, of, of a mechanism of that sort, one which is open to the public to contribute as well, for professors, industrialists, cont to contribute effectively to this mechanism, where we can all get, a, get on board in this national agenda? We have that. I mean, the draft laws are usually put on the website. It is open for public. They can contribute, public or anybody who can contribute. And usually any positive suggestions are taken very well by the ministers as far as my knowledge goes. Because I ran an NGO for seven, eight years and whichever laws, especially the land acquisition or any laws where I felt there are some things that needs to be added, I would write it to them. They would happily reply. I got imbibed in the law, not as a different story, but they would reply at least with an explanation or whatever. So. To an extent of uh, a common man's voice to be heard, I believe there is a scope. And the dra draft laws, when they are put on the website, there is ample choice for people to you know, participate in the issues. That's right. This happens particularly when the law is before the committee stage, before it gets to parliament. The committee can still make suggestions. And normally, yes, suggestions from the public are welcome that way. That's another way civil society can also contribute. <laughs>